the orbital theory. And for some reason, my voice is disappearing. I apologize for that. <coughs> so, big things that come out of it is your sigma and pi notations. So you've probably heard of sigma bonds and pi bonds before now and didn't really have a context of why they were coming about. They come about through kind of their reference within molecular orbital theory. Okay, and then we just kind of blanket statement use those references further on. So if you remember when we first talked about resonance, I initially tried to say or tried to avoid saying move pi bonds or move pi electrons. We didn't have a context of what pi electrons are. Pi electrons are those higher energy electrons floating through the p orbitals. Okay, we have access to those when we deal with resonance. Why do we have access to those? Because they're higher energy in orbital, they can skip through a pi system. They can jump from one element to the next, to the next, to the next, as long as there's a p orbital place for it to skip through. Okay? What this ends up doing for our overall structure, we prevent rotation. If we've got a conjugated, so pi systems that are interacting with each other, uh, we prevent rotation about those sigma bonds. If we look at the single bonds for our sigma bonds, sorry, our sigma bonds, we look for the rotation there, we'll notice that we won't see rotation, or we can see rotation there. Okay? And at this stage, we're saying there is no difference between those different rotational states. It's freely allowed to rotate, and we kind of ignore there being any other options, okay? which we'll find to be not perfectly true, but it's pretty close. Um, as a direct conclusion or result of our rotations being impossible within our multiple, multiple bonds, in particular our double bonds, we end up with what? Cis-trans Cis isomerism, which if you don't watch the video yet because it's not in there yet, uh, there will be a video coming out talking about cis-trans isomerism um, and how you go through and name those things accordingly. The next big conclusion that is universally forgotten and will continue to be brought up again and again and again has to do with the hybridization. Okay? The more you hybridize something, the higher energy those electrons become. Okay? Um, within that higher energy system, we also run into an interesting feature. We get less electronegative, okay? which may seem kind of weird. How can we relate electronegativity? Electronegativity is a property of an atom. So why is one carbon different from, say, another carbon? Well, the hybridization changes the arrangement of the electrons around that atom, which then changes how it interacts with other atoms. Can you prop that door open? Sorry. It feels, yeah, I'm hoping it's cooler out there. <clears throat> we'll change the arrangement of the electrons and how that atom grabs a hold of its electrons or even bonding electrons. So we see this big shift in electronegativity. The electronegativity is never quantified, at least for the sake of this class. We end up just saying, kind of memorizing, that under certain circumstances, that electronegativity change is enough that we can then look at different chemical properties coming out of it. Okay? So just kind of vaguely keep that in the back of your mind when we start to look at reactions or individual reactivities. <clears throat> the next big part of it... Um, is looking at kind of breaking bonds and making bonds. So the whole point of molecular orbital theory is to find out where your electrons exist. Okay? If they're in a bond, well, then that should be a stable structure and that per keeps those atoms connected. But what if we're making a bond? Well, in the process of making a bond, what do we have to do? What was that? We're more than likely going to have to break a bond at the same time. Okay? Depending on that situation, we're now changing the molecular orbitals and how they are depicted and interacting with each other. We can use a basic understanding of molecular orbital theory to then predict how a reaction could potentially occur, which is kind of a neat feature. Um, yeah, Going back to molecular orbital bulk density, if we have a large space with a lot of electrons, what's going to happen when we bring other electrons near it? going to repel and we're potentially not going to have a favorable bond interaction there because we get electron clouds interacting with each other. Okay? So let's kind of take a quick look at a molecular orbital diagram. Okay? 
uh, for CH3Cl, okay? methyl chloride, okay? or chloromethane. And in particular, I'm concerned about the bond between the carbon and the chlorine. So just as a first pass, why would I be concerned about the carbon-chlorine bond and not, say, the carbon-hydrogen bond? It is a polar covalent bond. Why do, why do I care? Uh, it's going to be different than the H bonds. How? Uh, being polar. Uh, yeah, you got the right idea. Keep going. Polar. More electronegative. The chlorine is more electronegative, making it partially negative. The carbon being partially positive. Why keep my focus there and not at the carbon-hydrogen bond? What charge builds on the carbon and hydrogen in a carbon-hydrogen bond? No charge. Should that molecule interact with anything? It's already in its neutral state. There is zero reason to interact with anything, which means no interaction. So when we look at a molecule, what we should immediately be doing is identifying our reactive bonds. How do we know they're reactive bonds? We're looking for those charges. Okay? If we can't find a formal charge, then we'll shift to looking at partial charges. That allows us to predict something about its reactivity. How are the electrons dispersed in that structure? The length of the bond doesn't matter here, right? What's that? The length of the bond doesn't matter here, right? In this context, we're not concerned about the length of the bond. Okay. So, if we're going to look at a molecular orbital diagram, we need to look at our atomic picture for our carbon and our atomic picture for our chlorine. So what would we expect? What orbitals do you think would be involved in making that bond from your atomic chlorine and your atomic carbon? What's that? Why? Okay, you just said that what we are looking for would be an sp3. sp3 from what? Why? There are four distinct groups of electrons around that carbon. If we look strictly at our atomic orbitals, can we get four equivalent groups of electrons? No. So our theory kind of falls apart when we look strictly at the atomic orbitals. So what do we say, okay, now let's average this out and set it up so we can actually interpret something. We'll go through and look at hybridization. So what we end up doing is tweaking our, our molecular orbital theory a little bit to get it to a point where we don't have to use mathematical symbols and calculations by looking at the exact atomic orbital overlap. So what we're going to look at is kind of a hybrid version of this. We're going to look at the hybrid orbital coming from our carbon. So if we look at the hybrid orbital for carbon, what would it appear? How would I draw that? What does an sp3 orbital look like? Four sp3 orbitals come together to make a tetrahedral shape. I'm not asking for four. I'm only asking for one. Why only one? Nope. Where are the other three orbitals? With the hydrogens. Do I care about the carbon-hydrogen bond now? No. All I'm concerned about is that carbon-chlorine bond. So I'm looking at roughly this shape, okay, with our nucleus in between. How about our chlorine? I drew that kind of big and kind of high up there. I heard the same thing. Why the same thing? Because chlorine is also hybridized sp3. Well, you're looking at an s orbital. So an s orbital is a valid interpretation. And sp3 is also a valid interpretation for our chlorine. Most people, if we're going to start the hybridization on our carbon, we should also look at the hybridization of the chlorine. And we look at the chlorine, how many groups of electrons are it? There are four. Can we come to the roughly same approximative molecular orbital diagram by looking at the s orbital on chlorine? We can. Okay. It makes a little bit more sense to be consistent with our, within our system. So let's stick with that and use our sp3. If I trip on, it's my own fault. 
So let's look at our atomic picture for the chlorine with an sp3. What happens when I bring those near each other? Okay, they overlap okay, in a direct system. Okay, now let's decide that overlap. Are they in phase or out of phase? Okay, why would you start with in phase? they're out of phase, there'd be no electrons between them, it wouldn't form a bond. So in this case, it makes sense. We know there's a bond, so let's put them in phase. Should that be a higher energy interaction or lower energy? Lower. Why? They'd be charged if we didn't have the bond. That's an interesting idea. If they're charged, they're naturally higher in energy. Does it make sense to have electrons in a bond? Have we seen this to be true? Yes. yes. For that to be true, we must be going to a lower energy. Otherwise, there's no reason to form that bond. So let's try and draw out our electron cloud. We would still expect a little bit of a lobe on both ends of these. And we would expect a lot of electron density in between. Okay, for those of you getting... Excited on drawing, you might want to hold off for a second here. Okay. So that's a reasonable depiction of this. Can we add more information to this? So we do see clear nodes. There's a node there and a node over there. There is still more information we could add. Do we know any information, say, about the carbon or the chlorine? Where are those charges coming from? Electronegativity. Electronegativity. So chlorine should be carrying most of the electron density. Does this drawing represent that better? Or no. represent that? No. So how could we shift this to make it a little bit more representative? That's a little bit better, but not much. You at least get the idea, right? Our electron density is shifted more towards the chlorine. What we now have is our bonding molecular orbital. Okay, what happens if they interacted in such a way where they didn't overlap? Or they weren't in phase? Okay, for sure, I'm going to have... Son of a and that didn't happen. Thank you. Yeah. We're definitely going to have an extra node. Right, how could we depict that within our drawing? Right, we're still looking at overlapping these two systems. In all of these cases, what we've done is overlap them, and then we're asking what is happening in that now colored in space. In the bottom case, we're saying they're in phase. They interact. In the top case, we're saying they're out of phase, which means they don't interact. So there's our other node in that exact space. How do we then disperse the electrons? Okay, we could put them in between the nodes. Those also look kind of small. Like a dumbbell. I mean, like, is it like a, is it a sheet of glass that separates the two, or is it just like a, so like, could the... Through that plane, wherever I've got those lines, that plane of that axis, which is now coming in and out of the board, yeah. nothing can pass. Okay. Even if it's like on the, no, this side or that side of the board, nothing? So like it can't... Nope. Okay. It's that entire plane. You cannot, can't jump around the plane. So we would end up with something along these lines. Our electron density is now spread to the outside. Okay? As a baseline molecular orbital, this isn't too bad. And we could go through and run with this diagram. In the bottom, we had a sigma bonding interaction. At the top, we have a sigma star, or an anti-bonding interaction. Okay? We can actually take this a step further. With the bottom one, we said the electron density spent most of its time on 
chlorine because it's more, electronegative. more electronegative. What do you think is going to happen when we move up to our carbon structure, our antibonding structure? Spend more time on the, uh, and There's no hydrogen in this drawing, so I don't quite accept that answer. The carbon. It's going to shuttle more towards the carbon. And this one will get a little smaller. Which would you expect, where would you expect your electrons to be? Oh, On the chlorine, because it's electronegative, this is the antibond. It's what doesn't happen. Okay. If we go through and now look at this bond, our carbon started with a single electron going into this bond. The chlorine started with a single electron going into this bond, which then means we would then populate our lowest energy with electrons at the bottom. And we'd have this higher antibonding orbital with no electron density in it. Relatively stable. What happens if for some reason something else came along, say like another atom, with a bunch of electrons? Where would it dump those electrons? Into the antibonding orbital. Because it can't go into the bonding, and the bonding already has electrons. What happens if electrons make it into the antibonding orbital? We now have too many electrons in our molecular orbital, and what happens to the original carbon-chlorine bond? It breaks. it breaks. Where does that atom dump its electrons? Well, conveniently, there is a massive lobe in our antibonding orbital for that carbon, which then means I can maximize the overlap with that antibonding system. What ends up happening? I can cause the carbon-chlorine bond to break at the exact same time I'm forming a new molecular orbital between a new atom and that carbon. What does this mean for the dynamics or the sterics or the direction of this reaction? Where did that new bond form? Formed with the carbon, yes, but where? By the hydrogens. By the hydrogens or on the complete opposite side of where the chlorine was. Because if it formed where the chlorine was, do we have any orbitals to overlap? No. Remember, within our diagram, that center point is our carbon. That center point is our chlorine. Our bond is happening between those. To form that new bond, it has to come in from the back side of that carbon-chlorine bond. And what we have now been able to do is describe the action of a particular mechanism within organic chemistry by looking at the molecular orbitals. Kind of neat. That's like six weeks away. Mm -hmm. Questions? <coughs> Would push up to the next level, make it form antibonds, and you can separate those two. Yep. Okay. Exactly right. It allows us to make and break new bonds. Do we have to look at it in this diagram to understand all that? No, we can make our predictions based off of the results we see, and we can make some kind of shape arguments that get pretty well, that work pretty well with it. The issue with those shape arguments is they don't fully explain where the electrons are moving, which is why we need this. We have to reconcile both theories. Other questions? Right. I should make you guys get up and talk. Uh, once the <laughs> third atom forms a bond with carbon mm -hmm. and kicks the chlorine away, will then the third atom kind of go where the chlorine was? Cause no, can't possibly do that. Because to do that, it would have to rotate all the way around. And we'll look at that in more detail as well on how those bonds are formed and what does that do to the arrangement of the other atoms. And you're right it would seem like it would just rotate around because there's not enough space. Something else has to happen. Octopus is an interesting way to look at it. I would refer to it as an umbrella in the wind, typically. I'll try and remember the octopus. So, next part.
right? We can now kind of take a break from all this kind of weird mathematics and shapes to get back to actually what Troy was asking about looking at isomers. If we look at butanes, C4H10, why is there an S? Why do I not just call it butane? Because there's more than one shape. Okay. What we are referencing is this formula has multiple possible structures. So if you drew a structure, which structure would you likely have drawn first? Okay. Your straight chain. That has four carbons, so we could reference that as a butane. Does that not also have four carbons? Yes. Does it have the same number of hydrogens? Yes. Those of you that aren't aware of that should draw on the hydrogens and count it out. Okay. There's no shame in it. In fact, if you start with that practice of counting out the hydrogens, you will do better later on. Okay. So we end up with two structures with the exact same formula. Okay. So we now run into a dilemma. They're both called butane because they have four carbons. But they are structurally very, very different. Okay. And within that difference, their interactions with their environment are going to be different. So we're going to get different chemical properties coming out of these. So we have to come up with some way to separate and reference which one versus the other. Okay. A standard way to approach and look at one and look at the other and make sure that we know exactly what we're talking about. There's two approaches to doing that. What are those two approaches? Some of them, one of them is directly shown on the board right now. Draw the structure. Formulas are meaningless. Draw the structure. Number two, name it. Come up with a standard rule set to name the compound. That is known as nomenclature. That's where we got butane from. Because but stands for four. Okay, in particular, four carbons. Why carbon? Because it's organic <laughs> chemistry. Hence, our rules for naming are about carbon. Okay. There's an extra little bit of information stashed in that name. It's not just butte. It's also ane. What does that ane stand for? Okay. All sigma bonds within the structure. There's no other kind of complex bonding within it. Okay. That gets us to kind of the hybridization of our carbons. So if there was a different hybridization, we could specify that by changing that AN to something else. So they're just ways of kind of piecing together the name, much like how my last name was put together. We just kind of average and put things together and jam them and say, this is the way we do naming. Okay. What if you came up with a different naming system? Well, if you taught me those rules, I would understand those rules. Okay. So I agree with that. But what about the rest of the world? You'd have to teach them too. All right? I might accept your naming system because maybe it's infinitely better. Right? That doesn't mean the rest of the world will accept it. And I would almost guarantee at this stage in the game there are enough old chemists that would insist on the old nomenclature system and would vigorously dispute your ability to change the name. Right? So we are stuck with those nomenclature rules. You need to learn them. All right? What is the relationship now between these? So they had the same formula. Does that make them the same compound? No, we already said we would name them differently. So what should we call the relationship between them? Okay, but they're different, so we might say they're different. Okay? Technically, different means something different than what we're used to in the standard English language. Okay? Different says they have different formulas. They have the same formula, we can't call them different. This is where we invent a new term. That new term is our isomers. Okay. So our different relationship is that formula is straight up different. Okay. It's not C4H10, it's C4H8. Those are now different from each other because the formula is different. Identical means the structures are the same and they are superimposable. Isomers means the formulas are the same, but the structures are not superimposable. So when we take a look at these two structures and we try to superimpose them over each other. So superimpose just means can we lay them over the top and everything matches up. I could lay these over the top, 
whoops, where these three carbons all perfectly overlay with these three carbons. Right? Everybody see that? Those three carbons are superimposable. Would the rest of the structure superimpose? No. So they're not superimposable. Because uh, I'm not sure I've got it there. Nope. Come back. So let's try a different butane. Did anybody happen to draw, let's say, this structure for butane? Nobody drew that. Okay. Did I find a new isomer? It has the exact same formula, and if I tried to superimpose that, those don't superimpose, right? This piece is different, or is in a different orientation than this piece. So we might go under the statement that these are isomers, and we would be wrong, because what did we not take into consideration? It's not cis-trans, because we don't have a double bond. It's sigma bonds, and what can sigma bonds do? They can freely rotate. Okay. If I freely rotate about this bond, what happens? They are now superimposable, and the relationship becomes identical. This was a simple example. As we build larger and larger structures, they become ever more convoluted. And you have to be able to recognize that you can rotate those sigma bonds. Okay. So if we went through and looked at coming up with a classification scheme, this will get more and more complicated as we learn more. You will be asked to identify the relationship between any two structures. You will only see this show up uh, this semester. Second semester for the final, we kind of ignore what's the relationship between these, and we just move on to more useful things. Okay. So when we look at our structures, we need to ask ourselves certain questions. The very first question we'll ask, molecular same molecular formula. If no, then they're different. If yes, then we have to continue going. I still have structure A and B. The next question I'll ask is, are they superimposable? That superimposable question is a very difficult one because that includes, did you rotate? Did you check all the possible rotations of the structure? Okay. As we move through this, you may need to go through and draw several different rotations and draw each of them out or build a model because this is where the model kit can help because if you build the model and tried to pick it up, you would notice that things start to bend and move and rotate. Why? They're all sigma bonds. And it would freely do that rotation. Every one of the model kits, as soon as you introduce a double bond, stops being able to rotate. Okay. So once you've now asked your uh, superimposable, and I can't even say that straight, if yes, then they're identical. If no, that's when we classify them as isomers. We run into all sorts of subcategories within isomers. Okay. The next connection we'll run with is same or different atom connectivity. If they have the same atom connectivity, then we are looking at stereoisomers. Okay? If they have different connectivity, they are structural isomers. So if we go back up to our top, what is the relationship between those two structures? Three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Same number of carbons. I'll leave you to count. The hydrogens are the same. So they have the same molecular formula. Are they superimposable? No. There is no way we could possibly superimpose those. Okay. So they are isomers. Do we have the same atom connectivity? And this one always seems to throw people for a loop. Let's go through and number these carbons. This is carbon one, two, three, four. Call this carbon five. Do the same thing on the other side. Carbon one, two, three, four, and carbon number five. In the rightmost structure, where's carbon number five attached? To carbon number four. In the leftmost structure, where's carbon number five connected? Carbon number two. They have different atom connectivities. 
different atom connectivities puts us under structural isomers. When kind of makes sense? Go ahead. When you go through and number the carbons mm -hmm. and you're comparing two different ones, do you have to change? Because I was looking at some of the books and they changed the way they number comparing two different structures. When you compare two different structures, you should maintain the same numbering system. Right? Where you might run into issues is your textbook may have swapped a structure and flipped it upside down. They're trying to maintain their numbering based off of the now flipped structure. So this becomes a very tough spatial recognition question. You have to be able to do these rotations and acknowledge that they are either the same or different. And then do superimposable over the top of that. Okay? This is not an easy task. And it will only get harder. This is where the model kits come in handy. Conveniently, the lab we're doing this week is models. There are four or five of you that are not in the lab. I will try and post the model activity so you have access to that for the lecture. Just as more practice. So, if we go through and look at our alkanes, we could start to bring in models and just kind of our drawing aspect. If we drew out methane, do we really care? Is it necessary to go through and specify all of these extra pieces of information? Not really, because the bonds are the same. All the orientations, we can't change anything. So if we wanted to, we could go through and kind of draw out the structure. And from our Vesper models, we should recognize, whoops, we tried to draw out our Lewis structure. We would end up with something like this. <coughs> Right, and we say, well, well, four groups, according to Vesper, means tetrahedral. tetrahedral. That's not drawn like a tetrahedron. So I will adjust to better show that tetrahedral shape. Is it necessary to show the tetrahedral shape? This case, probably not. Is it good practice to always start showing it? Yes. Okay. The next question. Is this a valid way to show that tetrahedral shape? Yes. Yeah. The bond angle is supposed to be 109.5. What did we just show? 90 degree angles. So while we've drawn something that we can understand and interpret, does it accurately reflect the three-dimensional shape? No. Do we care? Okay. If everybody walked around and you drew out you know, little kids drew stick figures. If everybody looked like stick figures, would that change our perception of the world? Yes. yes. That's the same thing that's happening here. You can draw things however you want, but that is going to change your perception of how these molecules interact. What you should be drawing is as close to that three-dimensional shape as possible because that will help you manipulate and understand what's going on with these structures. Okay. Um... Trying to think of an orientation that would be screwy. Oh, there we go. Just thought of it. How about that one? We still have two solid lines necessary for a tetrahedral shape. We still have a wedge necessary. Still have a dash necessary. Is it possible to orient the molecule? such that this shape or this drawing accurately reflects the model? Okay. It's a tough question. You will find no, not a chance in hell. Okay. How do I know that? Because I've had to spend several times taking the model kit and saying, look what happens to try and get this to orient in that view. It doesn't work. Okay. When it comes to the online homework, it may or may not accept this as a valid answer. Okay. So how can you ensure that you always get your answer correct? Your tetrahedral structure is a V and another V. Where are those points aiming? At the carbon. At our center carbon. Maintain those two Vs. Okay. If we looked at the other drawing, good thing I erased it. That was awesome. What are my V's doing? Okay. 
getting all sorts of weird nonsense going on in there. Make sure your V's point to the same direction and you should be okay. Try and get them as opposite each other as possible. Okay. What happens if we make it ethane? Lewis structure? Right? So add the Vesper to it. Go ahead and finish that one out for me. The red one, that is. Theoretically, you should have drawn it roughly the same speed that I did for the other one. And we should have two structures that you're looking at, right? What you draw for the purple one or the red one look like my purple one? Shouldn't be quite right. Are they different? No, they aren't different. Are they isomers? No. These are technically the same compound. Do they have the same energy? No. They have different energies. And in fact, their energy... Oh, you jerk. Their energies are so different. So if we look kind of closer here. Sorry, I mispushed. That red one that you guys drew out was probably this one here. Their energies are so different that that drawing does not accurately reflect the three-dimensional structure. It doesn't exist as far as we're concerned. That seems really, really weird. Why is that? It's not obvious to see from this, so let's grab that carbon on the, let's see, left. I'm going to grab that carbon and pull it out of the board at you. What would you see? We've already talked about this. This is our front carbon. <coughs> and our back carbon. Where are those hydrogens? What does that line represent? What's in a bond? Okay. Keep pushing it. It's not just a bond. It is two bonds. One's red, one's blue, right? Mm -hmm. Those two bonds have electrons in them. What are those electrons going to do? Repel. Repel away from each other as quickly as possible. What they're trying to show in that drawing below is that the front atom is rotating away from the other atom, which would get us to what kind of a drawing? If we look at the drawing that I drawn in purple, it is now actually shown right there as well. Why could we do that rotation? Sigma, Sigma, bond. Sigma bond. When we do that rotation, there is no change in the orbital overlap between those sp3 hybrid orbitals. So we get two possible orientations. Is it easier to see a difference between the energy of these two structures? Yes. One case we got electrons overlapping with each other. That overlap is bad. It caused the structure to say, F this, let me rotate. Let's free that up. By doing that rotation, we shift into a different drawing. Can that structure continue to rotate? What happens is it rotates this way. It goes up into that other hydrogen, which then means... It goes up higher in energy. Okay? And it's going to say that sucks, so what will it continue to do? Rotate. Continue to rotate until it centers nicely in the middle on the next one. We've ended up with two different conformational structures, which is bizarre because when we first started this, we said they were all the same. There was no difference between them. And now we are saying there is a distinct difference between them. 
and that will correlate out of their energy, which then means when we go through to draw the structure, we'd better be drawing the structure that makes the most sense to draw. Right? Well, which structure should we draw? Left or right? The one on the right because it's more stable because lower in energy. Everything is striving for neutrality, which is lower in energy. Right? Why is it lower in energy? What happens in that first conformation? We've got electrons overlapping with each other. We've put too much electron density in the same space, also known as like a negative charge. Okay. It's not formally negative, but we're building charge there by putting too much electron density in that same space. By rotating off, we minimize that interaction. Okay. Interesting little viewpoint on our molecule. So interesting, it allows us to come up with new predictions that, of course, the person that said, hey, you guys are full of crap, you can't just draw them whichever way you want, gets to name them. We're looking at Newman projections. Right? Exact same structure, all we've done is spun it into a different orientation, which allows us different information out of the structure. Which structure or orientation is better? The projections don't say anything about stability. Which should you draw? The Newman or our standard line angle? Newman's an interesting theory. What happens if we go through and make this more complicated? Add, say, a ring. Maybe a CH2, CH3. Uh, actually, let's make that a CH2 to a CH to a CH3. Newman gives us information about energy about a single bond. Does it give us information about any of the other bonds? No. No. So depending on what we are trying to do, we will draw one structure over the other. When it comes to chapter 4, what we are referencing is the energy of our individual molecules. So for chapter 4, the best drawing is Newman. How often do we care about the energy of our molecules once we're used to seeing that rotation? It becomes internalized, and we can look at our line angles and say, hey, this is a good Newman orientation, or this is a bad one. How do you pick that up? By practice. Draw a structure, draw the Newman. Convert back and forth. That is the only way to come up with it. Anybody that tries to memorize it, you are welcome to give it a shot. Unfortunately, you will fail. Okay? You have to go through and start drawing these structures and seeing those relationships. Okay. So if we looked at our ethane, there are some line angles. Clean it up. If we use an eyeball, so my drawing of an eyeball is much, much more hideous than this. But just so you know, it's usually something like this. Okay. Same general idea. We are looking now down that bond. So in this case, we are referencing the carbon 1, 2 bond. This allows us to see down that bond and come to some kind of conclusion within these we would end up with two different drawings. You'll notice in the drawing on the left, I am representing the leftmost structure, but I'm trying to offset it a little bit so that we can see the individual atoms behind it. Okay. If we go to the stru structure on the right, it is way offset. Why is it way offset? Because I'm trying to show a significantly different line angle drawing. We just addressed there's a difference in energy between these. There's a difference in energy. What do we need to do? Rhymes with framing. Oh, that wasn't that bad. Come on. Naming. We have to be able to name these so that we can distinguish the difference between those structures. What do you want to name the structure on the left? Now a really old reference, but we could look at vampires and stuff like that. That teen, tween stuff. There it is. Thank you. We have an eclipse structure. The bonds, that is that right thing, right? We're eclipsing the bonds. Okay? We can't see them, just like a lunar eclipse. What happens in the other case? Not eclipse. That's an awesome definition. Let's come up with a better one because that's too negative. 
we're now looking at a staggered conformation because our hydrogens are staggered from one another. Okay. Everybody understand eclipsed and staggered? Eclipse just means your bonds overlap. Okay. So if we tried to look down a double bond, Which conformation is more stable for the double bond, the eclipsed or the staggered? It's a nasty question, by the way. Where are the p orbitals in our double bond structure and the one drawn? They're in the plane of our paper, so that if we tried to rotate this structure out, so that we could look at it end on. Okay, we would show those as eclipsed. We just said eclipsed is an unstable conformation. Why does it not rotate to be staggered? Remember that p orbital overlap. It can't rotate. Because if it rotates, we destroy the p orbital. Okay. So we end up staying in the eclipsed conformation for a double bond because of that necessary p orbital overlap. Okay. And the sigma bonds, we don't need to worry about that because why do they freely rotate? We always have orbital overlap with a sigma bond, regardless of the rotation. Okay. So if we just skip bro propane, propane, and go straight to butane. Okay, we just had a straight tane butane, C4H10. Okay, a couple different ways we could draw that, so those are symbolized up there. Right? If we drew that out, we'd probably end up with this. What I'm now going to ask you to do is show me the Newman projection looking down the carbon 2-3 bond. So the 2-3 bond should disappear from view. Draw what you would see in the Newman projection. to make sure we find our frame of reference. In this case, you are told to look down the C2, C3 bond. So we need to reference the C2 and C3 bond. Okay? In this case, there is no difference between 2 and 3, so it doesn't really matter which one we decide to pick as our front carbon or our back carbon. You'll notice that I've been labeling F and B. Okay? And my quick walk around, I didn't notice anybody else do that. Why am I doing that? So I know what my frame of reference is. Okay? You need a frame of reference when you go through and draw these. If you don't have that frame of reference, you will lose track of each and every single one of your drawings, and you're now going to end up being in a guessing game. So make sure you identify your frame of reference. It is also helpful that I've got two different colors. I can now reference my red <coughs> carbon as being my front carbon. If this is my eyeball, looking this direction. At that position, I have two hydrogens and a methyl group. Where is the methyl group with respect to my eyeball? So what we're saying is we're taking this structure, and I'm now pointing it at you. Where is that methyl group? Down. It is straight down on that front carbon. My eyeball is here. There's my methyl. Straight down in the plane of the paper. Where are my hydrogens? So having a good view on what a tetrahedral structure looks like, this is always fun, you can use your hand. You only see three points of a tetrahedron with my hand, right? Where's the fourth one? 
My wrist. Okay, the center atom is where all those knuckles are. What happens if we now look at the structure? There. What is the approximate angle between those fingers? Roughly 120, which then means to draw on those other hydrogens, I need to be drawing them with a roughly 120 degree angle on it. Why should I specify the hydrogens? We always implied hydrogens before, why do we need to show them now? It's an orientation feature on our structure. Remember what we're concerned about are the groups of electrons in the bond. Is there a bond between the carbon and the hydrogen? Yeah. Yeah. Does that group of electrons potentially overlap another group? Is that going to change my drawing? Yes. That's why we need to show the hydrogens. How about the back carbon? What happens when I now take this structure and rotate that out so you can look at it? It points directly up. Where are my other hydrogens going to be? 120 degrees off to the side. You'll notice that when I went through and drew this, I did not draw that line all the way down to the middle. Why? If I draw that line, let's color it in purple, what I'm now doing is trying to connect that blue hydrogen to the front carbon, which is not the case. Take it another way, draw it with your pen and paper. Can you tell the difference between which atom is connected to what? Because they're all the same color. It doesn't work. All right? So make sure that you do not color that line in. We now have, whoops, I drew that as a hydrogen, our drawing. What happens if I rotate this front carbon 60 degrees? Oops. Now I'm doing it. What do we get? An eclipsed conformation. What happens if I continue to rotate? I would end up with a staggered conformation. Why am I drawing this one out? This one's of particular importance. This is a staggered. What was our first one? Are they the same energy? No. What does that mean? Technically different isomers of each other, but since they have different energies, times with framing, we have to come up with different names for these two different relationships. Okay? You will find that as we continue to rotate that carbon, we'll end up with another one, the one on our right, rotated up into this position. Okay? And we'll go through another staggered that is insanely high in energy. Why would, or sorry, another eclipsed that is insanely high in energy. Why? the two methyls will directly overlap with each other. Two different drawings means two different names. What do we want to name these? One way to reference it, where are those two groups relative to each other? Opposite sides. We could go with trans, and technically that name does work if we refer to it as an S trans. S for sigma. Under most situations, if we say cis-trans, we're referring to double bond. So that becomes dicey. There's another way to refer to opposite. Anti. They're on opposite sides of the structure. The anti-conformation, lower or higher in energy than our other conformation? Lower. Lower and higher than our eclipsed? Lower. The anti-conformation is the most stable conformation when it comes to Newman projections. What do we want to call the other one? How about not anti? Nice and creative. Right? Here's the reason. Uh, if we look here, the methyl group is just slightly to the left of it. And anybody speak French? Yeah? What is left in French? Ha <laughs> ha! Yeah! That's 
what I'm talking about. Look at that connection. We call it gauche. Can I spell it right? Yeah. Boom. See? There it is. Because the big groups are to the left of each other. Does that make any sense? No, it doesn't have to. We still call it gauche. Okay. That is the scientific term for this energy confirmation is gauche. If that methyl group, that red one, is moved over to the right side of the blue one, it's still called gauche because the blue is now to the left of the red. Uh, doesn't have to make sense, but that's what they call it. Okay. So that if we put this all together, we end up with four possible drawings that we could look at, starting with our eclipsed, which then moves to staggered. With ethane, do we worry about anti or gauche? Why not? They're all exactly the same. There is no anti or gauche. What happens when we shift away from methane up to a more complex structure? Now we end up with two different orientations that are still technically staggered. One we refer to as gauche, and the other one we refer to as anti. Okay? Questions about that? When you use the word gauche or anti, do we is that just a prefix to staggered or something? We would just drop the term staggered because gauche by definition is staggered. But you could go through and say this structure is in the staggered slash gauche conformation. Just calling it staggered leaves too much information out. So if they were eclipsed, but the methanes were on top of each other, is it still just eclipsed? Or so it's an interesting question. When we made it more complex by adding two extra groups here that weren't hydrogen, we looked at the staggered conformations as they subdivided out as different energies. You notice I didn't reference the eclipsed. Why not reference the eclipsed? There's actually a couple reasons, and then not just that it's, uh, let's see, do I got my drawing? I do have my drawing. It's not just that it's higher in energy. Okay, so what we've got here is butane, and what we've got is the starting at the zero degree difference between those methyl groups. Okay, that is going to be our highest energy point. So where would be high energy on this graph? At the top, so let's put a point there. We do one rotation by 60 degrees to the right with our front carbon. What happens? Okay, we're gauche, which is lower in energy. <clears throat> what happens with the next rotation? Oh, we're eclipsed again, which means higher in energy. Where higher in energy? Why between the blue and the red and not all the way at the same level as the red? Mm, I don't accept that. Okay. The methyls are going to interact more strongly than a methyl with a hydrogen. Why? Methyl is bigger. What does it mean to be bigger? More, I think someone was saying it. Electrons. It's electron repulsion. It's all electrons. Okay. In that first example, we have two very large electron groups butting against each other. Makes it super high energy. The next one, okay, the methyl is overlapping with the hydrogen. It is super high energy, but not as high. What happens in the next case? Anti, which means lowest point on our graph. Then it goes eclipsed where? Even with our second one. And I have to make that first one a little bit higher because it's not up there, right? Next one, gauche, so even, last one, same as the first. How would we go through and connect this now? Because what we're looking at is as we transition here, what's happening to the energy of my structure as I transition from the anti to the gauche? It is slowly going down until eventually it bottoms out. Then what happens? It goes back up. Then what happens? Then what happens? Sorry, now what happens? And? Why do I not subcategorize the eclipsed energies? They are different in energy. Why not subcategorize them? OK. 
Okay, probably something that you missed in 152. Seen these things, right? Product. What's the top? It's the transition state. Okay, the energy to get there is the activation energy. When you went through 152, you talked about concentrations of reactants, concentration of products. You even looked at activation energies. You looked at delta Gs, the difference in energy between the reactant and the product. Did you ever look at the concentration of the transition state? Why not? This is a fascinating one. It doesn't exist. It has no lifetime. As soon as we hit that point, we're already falling the other direction. Or we never made it to that point. Okay. Why do I not care about the difference in energy in our eclipsed conformations? They are all peaks. They are transition states and moving from one reactant to the other product. I don't care what to call that because it's either higher in energy or lower in energy. But it's still a peak. It doesn't exist. Can you go through and name it? Absolutely. But why? Okay. Questions about that? Okay. So there's a prettier version of it. See? Much nicer. You'll notice that they went through and quantified all sorts of other little lumps in there. Why did I not quantify them? Because I can't count that high. Okay. You could theoretically quantify and draw this out perfectly and beautifully and everything would be lovely. Okay? I would never expect you to quantify like that. I might ask you to overlay where's the energy for 3.6 kcals. Okay? Where's that best described? Okay? But that is it. Okay? So, next fun part. Cycloalkanes. You'll notice with cycloalkanes, we start with how many carbons? Three. Where do we end? Where do we end? Goes on forever. We could have as many atoms within a cyclic structure as we want. Okay, we tend to stick with these structures, and sometimes you'll see up to octane. Why do we typically not look at heptane or octane? This is a lovely answer. So they do have an interesting feature. They could twist up on themselves. There's another big reason why we don't deal with them. Try and draw one. That's about it. We're horrible at drawing them. Okay? If I can't draw them, I don't really expect you to draw them. Okay? Believe it or not, it does not start at three carbons. That seems a little bit weird. Hmm. Where should it start? Two carbons. We technically have already talked about the two-carbon cycloalkane. What is the two-carbon cycloalkane? A double bond. A double bond is a two-carbon ring. Okay? The distance between those is just so close that we end up referencing a different bond type. Okay? But it is the exact same thing. If you go through and look at the formula for any cycloalkane, you'll notice that it fits the formula CnH2n, where n is any integer. Okay. So if n is 3, what do we get? C3H6. What's our formula for propane? Oh, look at that, C3H6. Okay. Next thing, what if n was 2? What would we get? C2H4. Draw that structure for me. Son of a gun. Matches it perfectly. Okay. Why I'm addressing this is a lot of the properties that we pull from our cycloalkanes when interpreting their formulas also match directly to our alkenes. Okay. So you'll hear reference to saturation and unsaturation. Double bonds and rings count as the same thing. Why? Their formulas are a direct overlap of each other. They're a direct repercussion. Okay? So, when we look at our energy considerations, are there things that we should be looking at? What should we look at if we're going to do an energy consideration? 
not to give anything away, but Newman projections. How about a Newman projection? Because Newman projections show energy. So if we tried to draw a Newman projection for cyclopropane, what would it look like? Let's pick a bond to look down. What would we see? What do we have? Eclipse. Eclipse. What does it say about the energy of cyclopropane? <coughs> Very high energy because we are forcing our bonds into an eclipsed conformation. What happens when we move to cyclobutane? Same thing. Cyclopentane. Turns out not exactly the same thing. If you build a cyclopentane, what you'll notice is that one of those carbons can bounce out of the plane. When we look at propane and butane, those structures are really, really close to planar. And by being planar, we run into this eclipsed issue all the way through them. As soon as we hit pentane, there's enough freedom within that structure that one of those carbons bounces out of the plane. By bouncing out of the plane, what does that do to the eclipsed conformation? Lowers the energy. And we end up shifting towards something that's staggered, but it's not fully staggered. So what does that mean happens to our energy as we go from propane to butane to pentane? Okay, it becomes more stable. What happens when we hit cyclohexane? Okay. Cyclohexane is kind of a magic point. The structure not only has the opportunity to pop out of plane, it naturally and almost immediately upon building will completely pop out of the plane and it is no longer flat. When we move up to cycloheptane, what happens? There's now so much more motion in the structure that it actually goes up in energy. Cyclohexane is our sweet spot when it comes to energies. What does that mean we need to do? We need to be able to see and visualize that. And we will do that by looking at models, models and in particular, which view of our structure? Newman. The Newman projection we will find that the Newman projection is a pain to draw. That's why we're doing the lab. You're welcome. Okay. We'll come up with another orientation with it, which is our chair conformation. Yet another way to change our viewpoint on the molecule. It'll help us understand and visualize something about the structure and the relationship between the hydrogens on any given atom. Kind of a neat little process. And we'll 